Morning once again and thanks for joining us on The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. Now let's go to the papers and see what major stories have made headlines this Tuesday morning. I'm starting with the daily independent newspapers and we expect that to be flashed on your screen in just a few seconds. Uh, we would of course be all introducing our guests right after uh, sharing the stories. Yes, it says there, major one, safety concerns in aviation as skilled staff dump agencies. Pilots, engineers, air traffic controllers resign en masse. It says also, federal government should have borrowed to grow economy, not only exit recession. And that's from former governor Peter Obi. Buhari okays 13 billion naira for community policing vol volunteers, directs local production of weapons to meet armed forces needs. Okay. Also, EFCC laments rising corruption among bank officials, justifies declaration of assets directive. And SARS, Lagos police won against planned memorial protest. And uh, State Congress, APC makes drug test mandatory for contestants in Kano. Nigerian Eagle, pilots, engineers won National Assembly to stay clear of NCAA, say reps undermining agency's autonomy. And also, leave us out of politics, IPOB won Senator 2022 gubernatorial elections, I'm ready to contest and win equity, says Oni. Away from the Daily Independent, the Daily Trust now. Ministers sack looms as Buhari supervises appraisal. It says also, uh, one's cabinet members on mandate delivery. President in race against time, says ex-permanent secretary. 2023, attempts to cause rift between Tinubu and Ushibanjo will fail, says the presidency. And after 20 million naira ransom, Bugundu Emmer still in captivity. Constituents tackle Bajabia Mila over delay in declaring late plateau reps seat vacant. Also on the Daily Trust this morning, 1.3 million Nigerian girls drop out of schools annually, says UNICEF. We can also see further devaluation would worsen poverty, unemployment, expert counters uh, Oshimbajo. And also uh, anti-open grazing, it's senseless to enact unforceable law, says Obaseki. Now to the Punch newspapers, big one there says, states lament deductions, demand probe. Uh, subsidy rises to, to 8.2 billion naira daily. Four subsidy opaque and NPC acts as government uh, on its own, says Commissioner's Forum. States helpless over deductions. Federal government a dictator, says uh, Delta Commissioner. Also on the punch, work begins on 16.39 trillion naira budget. Senate panel gets documents today. And budget, federal government allocates 4.2 billion naira to moribond Ajakuta Steel. We can also find here, um, experts differ, as Oshimba Joe says, exchange rates artificially low. Federal government stopped residency payment after strike suspension, says NARD. That's interesting. And also ICRC arraigns ex-presidential aide Obona Obla for certificate forgery. Lassa fever kills 77 in Edo, Ondo, um, others, and 356 hospitalized. Evacuated destitute area boys to be kept for monitoring, says uh, Ondo State. And um, also here, sit at home, gunshots rock Anambra, guard killed in Enugu, Imo State grounded. Um, I think we're going to move away from the punch now and see finally what we can find on the leadership. Experts and others oppose Oshimbajo on Naira devaluation. Our current forex is artificially low, not good for investment, says the vice president. And we can also see here 44% of Nigerian girls marry before 18 years, says a report. Uh, military kills 30 bandits in Zamfara. Gombe grants autonomy to legislature and judiciary. And PDP chairmanship, northern leaders divided over Mark, Shema, Dankwambo, and Ghana. Uh, finally, on the leadership this morning, Nigerian economy vulnerable at 75% debt servicing, says additional. We'll say good morning to our guest uh, this morning, Mr. Chris Wandu. Thank you so much for joining us this Tuesday morning. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Great to have you on the program. All right, I'm going to start with um, the story on the uh, from former governor of uh, uh, Anambra State, Peter Obi, and this is on the Daily Independent saying federal government should have borrowed to grow economy, not only to exit recession. Let's start with that one. What are your thoughts? Absolutely, and that's what Fonny said. When I uh, 
we heard that the um, Minister of uh, Finance saying that the Nigeria exited the um, recession through uh, borrowing. That didn't make any sense to me. Uh, we should be borrowing to develop our infrastructure, grow our infrastructure, because basic uh, reason why you borrow is to grow infrastructure and be able to make money to pay back, pay back these loans. But when you now borrow to now uh, pay your loan down, then does it make any sense? Nobody does that. We should be thinking of uh, capacity building and uh, developmental projects with uh, the, the money we are borrowing because that's supposed to be the legacies that the government will leave behind. If they are borrowing just to service them, then what legacy are you? Capital projects have totally collapsed uh, uh, in the past few years. What we just continue to see is recurrent expenditure, recurrent expenditure. But as of the last time, we, used to, we had it initially to find but from what the minister said, we are now using about 74% of uh, our revenue to service debt. Then what is left? We are talking about probably about 20, 26 percent um, for other exigencies and running of um, government capital projects and all the likes. Then that is why we are Nigeria continue to slide into poverty. So coming out of the recession is not an issue for me. The fact is that the money that are borrowed, can you account for them? Because this government is not going to pay back those loans. Don't forget. Uh, I saw. Uh, uh, I saw a headline one of the papers was it yesterday about where it analyzed how much you and I as an individual or as Nigerians are owing. I'm sure you saw yeah. that too. Uh, so you, as you are sitting down there, you are owing some foreign, some foreigners close to about 70,000 naira. So 70,000 naira is, is to your name. And <laughs> we, are, when we have less, less to nothing to do with those boys. So I totally agree with which will be in that way. Don't forget that uh, this is a go- somebody who was a governor for eight years and he left an indemnable mark in an Anambra state. Go and see most of the protests he had done. And uh, you are not talking, also talking about Pandora uh, initially when he came out just to defend himself on some of the issues raised. And he said, Oh, he said you still find about 500 million in my account. Please, I, I take it. If wherever you find that 500 million dollars, take it. And he came out to say that I did not steal any money uh, from the Anambra State government. I came out and gave an account of myself. I have not seen any government not done that it's since 1999. Came out, gave the balance sheet, said what was spent, what was left, what he even left in shares. He left. He said what he left in shares, left in cash. In fact, the day I, I remember the day he was running that, he was doing that. He, left. he had managing directors of various banks, and he said. I have also a amount in your. Um, I, we have also a amount in your at the bank. Please confirm, MD. And the government, the manager, I told say yes. Anambra has that. You call the next bank, MD. I say we have also a amount in your uh, account. Please confirm that. So when P two B talks uh, in terms of uh, economics, I totally agree with that. Yeah, I want you to also quickly, you know, very briefly respond to some of the things I was saying earlier, how we seem to place certain people on a different standard from the others. Um, you know, very many of the people will not be placed or, you know, expected to declare or make these same statements explaining the source of their wealth um, while they, of course, seek political office. But, you know, we would, of course, expect, or Nigerians, you know, would demand from persons like Peter Obi while there's other people who have questionable, somehow, some way, uh, source of wealth, they wouldn't be asked these same questions. He who comes to equity comes with clean hands. Peter will be definitely, from what he has been doing, has nothing to hide. Don't forget that there are also some, one or two governors, uh, even the current governors that were uh, accused of such, if you remember. And all the judges just issue a press to the accused uh, press secretary. It will be his coming now with, with figures with documents to back what they have. And he said that, he said I wasn't a poor man when I became a um, governor. Don't forget that I was chairman of a bank. I, was, I had uh, thriving businesses across the globe and the rest of them. So, uh, but um, I, I, in as much as I don't want to castigate uh, uh, some of our colleagues uh, who came up with those reports, but I don't think that report was so in there. Because if you look at people with that, with barely looking, you will see that there are certain individuals that you expect their name to come up. There are so many of them <laughs> that we know that have um, mansions, that have offshore accounts, that have 
It is across the globe, U.S., Dubai, name them and rest of them. None of them were touched. At times, I tend to look at this as politics, about politics to some extent, because uh, 2023 is here. Uh, and I don't want to believe that some people have been trying to uh, be uh, profiled just basically because of politics. But if we go, go read down, we we'll realize that there are so many people that are supposed to be on that list that means so bad. Good enough, as, as I said, it's good that Peter is coming around to them. Uh, and he said, he says, if you have anything, and I overheard, um, I overheard uh, one of the editors of a uh, Premier Times, one of the radio stations in Africa, yesterday, speaking about that investigation. I think he was the guy was the head of the investigation, part of the investigation, and he said that we are not saying that Peter B stole money. What we are only saying that he did not uh, declare his assets when he came to uh, as a as a former government. He didn't give full disclosure. We are not saying that the man stole money. And that to yeah. me, is, if it's just not declaring his, all his assets, then all well and good. But what I should be thinking oh, is that looking wonderful. at those that have stolen so much from the from the forces of Nigerians, those are the people we should be looking at. All right. Now, let's still on the Daily Independent, if you see there, it says, NSARS, Lagos warns against planned memorial protest. Uh, share your views on that one, and um, let's uh, know what you think. Well, uh, there's no, there's nothing, uh, there's no law against this proposed test. I think that has been dealt with by the Supreme Court of Nigeria. So every Nigerian has a right to protest at any given point in time if you agree by any policy of government or any issues that concerns you. Only the only way you'll be breaking the law if it becomes violent. If it becomes violent, then you can you'll be arrested and they prosecuted. And if there's just a distortion of life and property, then you can also be arrested. And I think, uh, for me, those that are marking the, uh, the one-year anniversary of um, NSAS um, are right to do that. Uh, I don't have any challenge with that. But the problem is that can you be able to uh, also be able to make sure that this does not get out of place? Are you sure that good laws will not take advantage of that protest and be able to recover? We've seen that separately in, in Nigeria, and especially in Lagos. In the past. Yeah, but, but, but Mr. Wandu... Mr. Wandu, you know, I, I know that, you know, I know what the law says, and I'm sure a lot of people also know that uh, peaceful protesting is not, you know, illegal in Nigeria. Um, the challenge really is the way that the Nigerian police force um, addresses peaceful protesters that seem to be, you know, painting government in a bad light. Um, it is yeah. the speed at which, uh, you know, policemen are sent on the streets to clamp down on protesters that, aren't causing any harm or damage or aren't being violent um, and are being entirely peaceful. And you've, you've seen this multiple times, not just in Lagos, across the country. And I think that's where the challenge is. And, right. you know, when, when you speak right. about, you know, how do you prevent it be, from being, you know, hijacked by hoodlums and this and that, it's not the role of the protester to ensure that hoodlums don't hijack a protest or don't cause violence. It is still the responsibility of security agents to protect the protesters and ensure that whoever is causing mayhem is arrested, isn't it? That's what that's where I was heading to uh, before you came in. I said I was going to say that the, the police also hold the protesters um, the protection on themselves because what you do is that um, during that the, the protest the police were supposed to be shield, be more like a shield, be able to guide the, the protesters to make sure that the protest is not hijacked. By hoodlums. That's what I was also going to because I'm saying that um, it's a two way thing. Even when the police is there, you can be rest assured that some of these things at times get hijacked. I remember my days in, in the university where we start um, a protest against any issue and the rest of them. Once we hit the, uh, the express, we see so many people joining us. I'm sure you, you are aware of that. You see some, even if the police is there, you see people, you see mechanics, you see drivers, you see all sorts of people. That take advantage. In fact, they are the those people are the first set of people that start mounting roadblock, even before we the students. So those are the issues I'm talking. So most often than not, I think and I, I believe that that's the way this protest can be held without necessarily making sure, without necessarily getting this route long to take advantage of that situation and not cause mayhem. Um, don't forget that also the NSAS, you saw the, how the NSAS protest ended. You know, it started on a very good note, people coming to the um, to the toll gate, you know, um, protesting with peacefully and sharing food, the music, and the rest of it. It was so peaceful until at a point where the security agents came in and started dispersing them, put up the lights and the rest of them. 
and um, it went out of control. So the uh, I think there should be a meeting point between the protesters and police so that we can have a very, very peaceful But In fact, as I said, the every individual, every Nigerian has a right to protest. And once it's peaceful, that is lawful. The Supreme Court has so many tasks. And the Supreme Court has even went as far as saying that you don't need to get any police permit to protest. That was that has been decided by the Supreme Court. So um, you and I are on the same page on this. Um just before we move on to another story, because I want us to talk um, next about the uh, budget, um, isn't it, you know, uh, 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 what does, you know, the fact that there's still conversations about a memorial protest, what does that even, what does that say to you? Does it, you know, you know maybe say that the reasons behind the protest and the justice that, you know, those people sought one year ago is still missing in the conversation? Um, justice for victims is still missing in the conversation and the slow pace with which uh, those panels that were set up have been running in the last one year is still not satisfactory enough and almost a lot of people can see that this is just a waste of time. Um, it, it, is that what it interprets to you or would you say that these you know, young Nigerians are really just impatient with the Nigerian government and looking for means to protest once again? Memorial uh, um, um used to remember uh, certain individuals or uh, events. See, today, Martin Luther King, uh, they have been declared, and you know that there's a memorial to that effect. On the, on the years, it's over 50 years now, and you have the Martin Luther King, and on, on that day, people still protest. There's still a uh, racial segregation in the U.S. Just yesterday, we were watching, watching national channels. We were seeing where a particular um, um, fiscally challenged black man was pulled out of a car by police and brutalized in the U.S. That is the United States. So, so it, it is an ongoing thing. And to back to Nigeria, answers definitely. Yeah, some people were allegedly killed, and um, their memories uh, will have to be celebrated. That is one. Two, so it's also to a reminder to the government that some of the things that we protest against has not been addressed. Thirdly, don't forget that look at the Lagos uh, panel that was set up. See, now that panel has not been able to deliver. Um, I'll close, uh, finish deliver, uh, delivering judgments. Most of the issues that are raised, that panel is still on one year after, and there's not been any substantial, um, how will I say, success in, in the activities. At times, most of the time, the police, the military are invited and they don't show up. So, uh, so for the uh, for the organizers of the protest, it's just a reminder of what happened last year, and to remind government that some of the reasons why we protest have not been addressed. Although you say you are going to address it. There was a committee that was set up by the federal government where you have even some of these uh, leaders of these uh, protests as members. What had come out of that? Then those that we are killed have then been compensated, have the families been compensated and rest of so, um, so there is there must always be a full closure. Until that is done, you don't see people just giving in to some of these things. So yeah. I believe that um, the essence is just to remind the federal government and Nigeria that some of the issues that we raised last year is still uh, from Ghana. And just to also quickly mention before we move to talking about budget that um, there was, of course, reports that I saw yesterday that uh, James Wanfo, uh, one of the um, uh, police officers in Anambra State that was accused Anambra of some State. of the most gruesome crimes, um, yeah, yeah. Um, is yeah, currently like the uh, chief security officer to um, um, uh, Charles Sundu, uh, the of course, a, well, one of the candidates for the Anambra State governorship elections, um, which, yeah. of course, also uh, makes it seem like Justice, really, for those victims who may never uh, be gotten. But let's move away from that and talk about the budget. It says on the punch, top of, of the punch this morning, uh, federal government allocates 4.2 billion naira to moribund Ajaokuta steel. It's um, quite unfortunate uh, that we are still having all issues of allocating, uh, making budgetary allocation to most of these uh, um, companies uh, uh, that moribund as it were. Um, it's not just uh, don't forget what happened has happened in the past um, few years uh, with the refineries. You remember how much we continue to allocate to the refineries, Kaduna, in uh, Wari, in uh, Otokot, and the rest of them. And none of these refineries have been able to turn on one single liter of oil. And we spent trillions and trillions of naira, uh, billions of naira uh, in turnaround maintenance, and we have not been able to maintain anything. And we continue to report practically close to about 99% of our oil imports 
uh, fuel uh, consumption or petrol consumption are important. So uh, I don't know why we are still pumping money into Ajakuta. When what we would have done is go into collaboration with private companies and uh, on the bilateral agreements, uh, be able to hand it over to them to be able to and, um, handle. Ajakuta Steel Company, is, as I've already said, is one hell of a company that, if properly put in place, can help us out of the current economic situation we find ourselves. Um, they are, we sunk in trillions and trillions of naira in that, into that project. I've been there um, about twice, once as a youth copper when I started in Kappa, uh, in, in uh, uh, current Kogi State, and I was, we went uh, on the excursion to place. I was shocked by what, it's a place that you cannot even go or tour, tour within one week because it's so large. So what I thought that, and there was a time that the government came out and said that, oh, okay, we are going into back to partnership with the Russians that built the Ajokita state to make sure that uh, we revive it. Till now, I don't know what happened to that uh, uh, initiative. So if you are pumping uh, billions of Naira into it, what do you intend to gain? So I think the solution for that, for me, is to go back to the drawing board and um, have some kind of agreement with the uh, private uh, companies who are interested or, to some extent, let's try to balkanize it and divide it into uh, various segments and ask particular companies to take it up. Just as we're doing with NNPC now that we are now unbundling um, NNPC through the PIA. I see the same thing can happen with uh, Ajakuta Steel and so many other steel. Don't forget, we need to have Alaja still really, uh, uh, still really mean. We used to have Oshubu still really mean. Those are a, a, a huge investment that if you have been able to sustain that, then I don't think it would have been where we are today. But all those uh, state ruling com um, companies have totally collapsed. Successive government have closed their eyes to it. And this, the whole place has just returned to junkyards, and, uh, which is not good enough for us. We are talking of diversification of our economy from just one product, the oil. Whereas we have so many other avenues that we can make money. But I don't think we're looking deep. All right, and um, also um, moving on to the Daily Trust newspaper this morning, I saw something pretty interesting. It says here, yeah, Minister Zach looms as Buhari uh, supervises appraisal. Um, ex permanent Secretary says the President is in a race against time. Um, do you, you know, expect that there might still be some changes with the President's team, um, of course, as we approach 2023? If it's the same president, I know, uh, I know since 2015, definitely I don't expect anything to come out of it. Uh, president has a way of sticking with his uh, left hand hands and ministers as it were. One or two that we've seen are presented just for, due to certain, uh, due to some circumstances, uh, which has been But the president, don't forget that some people that have been in this government and ministers for six years, the same with the president, and, and they are not performing and nothing has been done to them. So, I don't know. Uh, well, let's wait and see. But I'm not optimistic uh, about this appraisal or whatever it is. It is against time. The president had a mandate of eight years. He has spent almost six years. What will he be able to achieve in two years that he has not been able to achieve in six years? I wouldn't know. But if that is the way the new initiative by the president, all well and good. But I expect the president as a, uh, the president of the federation and the uh, chief executive of Nigeria State to, on a periodic basis, appraise these ministers, not only the minister, the permanent secretaries, and even head of MDAs and MDGs, and there should be a, 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 there should be a performance schedule for all of them. If you fall below this standard, then you go. That's what should be done, because their activity or inactivity will affect the president as a person, because at the end of it, it will be held responsible. No minister will be held responsible. It will, be, it will be Buhari's government and not Rotimi Amechi's government or Pashola's government or the president, the box stops at the desk of the president. Not even at the doctor, uh, desk of, of, um, uh, of the vice president of Shibato. It's the president. So if it's not what he's supposed to do, to be able to make sure that these ministers are formed. For goodness sake, my brother, where you work, lost TV, there is a standard that the management put in place. Everybody has a standard. You have a goal. You have a the, 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 the organization have a vision. They have a mission. If you cannot get to that vision and mission, then you you show the, the the way out. That is supposed to be the same thing with governance. If the ministers are not performing, you don't need to wait for anybody to be able to tell you that this guy is not performing and it's not. The thing. Yeah, but, then, but what does it what does it tell? Happen? What does it tell if we go six? This is what the, almost the seventh year of the current administration, 
Um, what does it tell if we go that long, you know, and there's barely any changes made? And even the time that the service chiefs were changed, you know, it took more than a year, two years of persons clamoring for, you know, them to be changed. Does it say uh, to you that it's either the president doesn't understand that these people are failing or um, he understands, you know, that it's not their fault that they haven't done well enough? It's leadership failure, leadership deficits, um, lack of leadership, because you're as good as your last game. Um, when you go into, just like Nigeria, just, uh, you saw what happened uh, in the uh, match Nigeria had with CAR. I remember you, uh, I was watching what you were talking about, I think it, on the day of the uh, match, where you said the roads were blocked and the rest of them, and you were complaining and the rest of them. Nigeria lost that match. And what happened? In the second leg that was played in Cameroon last weekend, the church has made some changes and brought some more viable and, uh, and more skillful players. And what happened? We turned that defeat um, to, uh, to winning. And Nigeria won 2-0. This was the thing that beat to 1-0 in Nigeria. But it went to Cameroon to beat, uh, to beat um, CAR 2-0. That is leadership. That is that is what what does that bring to place. So if you see any of these people are not performing, it is the book is on you because you are the one that appointed them. Let me let me even take this further. Don't forget what the president said initially when he came in and appointed the people are complaining to people. He said most of those that he appointed as minister, he didn't know them. I'm sure you remember that. I remember. Yes. He said so. Yes. He said he didn't know them. Then you gave we gave him the benefit of the doubt. If if you didn't know them, I went to watch them for about two years and they are not performing. Why don't you remove them? Then in 2019, you now appointed them. This time, you cannot say that you didn't know them again. You appointed these people to work with you, and they are not delivering. So that is what that's the leadership deficit on the part of the government. It's on the part of the president. That means that the president is not doing what he's supposed to do. If you be able to this on top of this game, you come to realize that most of this close. If I if I have my way, 90 percent of this minister should just wait for others to be able. To. We have people who are capable to do this, but they have not been given the opportunity to do that, and that is why we're finding ourselves. Look at the economy, how to study the economy is in shambles. And we have a minister of finance, we have a, a minister of economic plan, we have um, um, uh, um, the governor of the central bank. We have so many people within the economic team, but are we getting it right? Somebody is coming to tell us that um, the, 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 uh, uh, the Naira as against the dollar is not doing bad. How much was the Naira to the dollar when you came into it? How much is it now? That is what we should be looking at. All right. And uh, I think finally, we can just quickly share, um, I, I'm not sure which to go with now. There's a story in the punch here that says, federal government stopped residency payments after strike suspension. And that's from the NARD. If you can quickly just share your thoughts on that one, if we have time to also squeeze in another story. Yeah, well, uh, it should be, I'm sure that the Nigerian medical um, uh, enemy that um, has the not, not to suspend the strike um, that should be them. They should take that up because they are the one that has their ability to suspend this strike. Too many some people still believe that most of even now they say we are saying that most of the agreement with, with the government they don't think that the government affects. So um, the NMA came out and um, took side with the government and they asked not to suspend, which led to the suspension of that strike. So if now is coming out to say that um, the suspension there is a suspension or there is a suspension of of the allowances, then I think it's because we or within the preview of Nigerian Medical Association to go back to the government that is negotiated with on behalf of that for the government to do the need to. Um, so the bulk now, to me, I won't blame the government as far as this is concerned. I think I'll blame the NMA for not being able to do the need to and do the digest because of the negotiation with the government. State Congress, APC makes drug tests mandatory for contestants in Kano. Uh, Mr. Wandu. I'm I'm sure you are laughing just as just as I, just as I am here. Uh, what with that song, <laughs> drug test? Is it that they are taking a uh, ego or cocaine or which of these things and the rest of them? Uh, well, uh, the problem we have is not issue of drug tests or uh, political leaders. The problem we have is lack of capacity and um, corruption. That is our problem. Not even the same candle that we are talking about. Did you hear that? The wife of the governor was recently arrested by EFCC. Uh, that he was saying, I'm sure he was yeah, that. Yes, I uh, that yes, the, and the wife, this time around, is a family affair because it was the son that reported the mother to EFCC and said, This woman has listened to me of my own arrest. So uh, I think the candidate 
professional uh, and uh, more creative in his approach. The problem of Nigeria, as much as politics is concerned, is not about drugs. It's the ability of Nigerian politicians to be able to deliver on their promises and get uh, and get accountable to Nigerians who elected them. So if you are making a promise to me, there should be a mechanism where if you are not delivering, then I can be able to recall you or send you packing. So those are the issues. So it's not just about drug. If you're talking about drug, then you can uh, most of our leaders so, so called leaders are they not are they not taking drugs. That is not the issue for me. The issue is lack of capacity and ability to what we are doing is picking people that are not capable for the job. If we get the right people that can do the job, not just because of politics and rest of that, you can get the job done. There are so many instances that we have got a techno card and they delivered. Most of them are not, if you see what happened during the Obasanjo regime, most of those that they work with, we are technocrats. They are not politicians. Okundo, Iwala, Obvious, Equestini, Adeshin, or you remember most of those guys and rest of them. And, and they delivered. And even in economy, the key, the bulk of our problem now is economy. As, as well, I'm talking of federal, and I'm not talking of Canada now. It's economy. If I get the economy right, then I'm sure that every other thing that is bet back to the Canada State uh, APC, I don't know. Is it the NDA that going to invite to? Don't forget that NDA recently raided Lagos, some hideouts in Lagos and some other places where they are talking about picture of drugs and rest of the But I don't think that is the problem. The problem is making sure that we get the right people to do the job. Making sure that we put the right uh, the, the square peg in a square hole or round peg in a round hole. Then we can delete, deliver. Maybe I'm saying I'm going to test. For after testing the person today, tomorrow, if he goes back to drug, what will you do? What will you oh, do? Um, I, I think it also paints a picture of you know the drug, seeming drug crisis in northern Nigeria. Yeah, that isn't yes. spoken about enough. Um, I'm, I think that's also where it's uh, pointing at. But also on the Daily Independent, top right, it says Buhari OK's 13 billion naira for community policing volunteers directs local production of weapons to meet armed forces needs. We have always said that community policing and state policing is the way forward. So if the president is coming up with community policing or whichever name we call it now and making funds that they Oh, well and good. Then my problem that I hope that money will not go into certain pockets. And that will be the end of it. You know the way we work is, uh, here. You put some money for a part, uh, particular. And at the end of it, all, I, I don't know. Let us. I mean, let me even a bit quickly go back to you. Remember the, the job, the 20,000 Naira job for 774 yes. local government. You remember that one? Yes. You, you, you know that that one has quickly died. Most of those guys were not paid. And I heard that most of them are still not yet paid now. And we have moved on as nothing. Billions and billions of naira was a man for that uh, project. What came out of it? So for me, I think the, one to, the way to go is let us look at the constitutional amendment as we as the National Assembly is going through it now. And make sure that we're able to um, go, move forward with the uh, state policing as we have agreed. Um, the Saudis have agreed that they have a who will come into play um, into fall by the end of December. And my title is already in Southwest, other regions are also looking at that. But there's a civilian JTF in the north. That is community policing. So the one that the president is making money up, is he going to assist the states who already have most of his community policing, or is it coming up with another system of uh, policing as it were? But for me, the challenge is not coming up with such initiative is how are we sure that that money will be used for what it's supposed to be? And but most importantly, this very current police is underfunded. If you think that you need that money, for me, I would rather thought that you just put that money into policing and ask them to recruit more, to give the, the police that the certain billion and get them to recruit more people into the force. And you might be, we might have some changes. But how many policemen do we have? About five hundred thousand or there, about for a country of about two hundred million people, it's not possible to police that. Yeah. So I am for community policing and for police um, state policing, but I think that fund can be utilized properly. And I hope that you're not going to private pockets as it's always, you've always had it. Okay. And, and also, you know, the, the conversation about locally uh, produced weapons. Um, are we being serious with that? We have been producing weapons in the past. We have been producing weapons. That's, uh, what is it? Is this small arm? Um, I've forgotten the name. Small arm, um, whatever. I think it's a cabinet or something like that. Uh, that um, that uh, meant to produce uh, small arms. I mean, we, could have, we can do that. I think we can effectively produce enough small arms in Nigeria. Sometime ago, somebody, I think a minister, somebody came out that in the next few years, we are going to 
uh, come up with uh, our own uh, fighter jets and the rest of them. Somebody came out sometime ago to sell that. And I was just laughing. If you cannot produce ordinary AK-47 or Chakapula that you needed to wear, they're talking about it. It's, it's something we can do. It's still brought down to leadership and funding. If those places are funded well, I know that is a, 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 a company or agency that was that uh, I can't remember the name now, but if you Google it, you see that is started with the responsibility, federal government agency that started with the responsibility of producing small arms. I'm sure they can do this. They can do it in the thousands and hundreds and the rest of them. All we need to do is make sure that we give them all the necessary purchase and ability to support. So that because getting this arm from across the uh, uh, other parts of the world is becoming expensive. We don't have the money. We don't have the foreign exchange. So if we can be able to invest uh, in, uh, in Nigeria and produce this, it's better for us. So that is also saving us a lot of um, uh, foreign exchange. So I think it's something we can do. Uh, but are we going to have the political way to do it? Uh, I not Oh, we'll see. Um, now, let's talk, talk a little bit about health, you know, and uh, while the COVID-19 conversation seems to also be dying down, um, you know, we, we seem to have other health challenges. It, it used to be, well, a few weeks ago, a month ago, it was uh, cholera. And now we're hearing about Lassa fever. It's in the news this morning that Lassa fever kills 77 in Edo, Undo, and others. And there's 356 hospitalized. And this is uh, bottom right of the Punch newspapers this morning. We always have that challenge. Um, just as one uh, one is going, uh, definitely another one will come. It has always been like that across the globe, not just Nigeria. So we only have to be proactive. Um, our, the relevant agencies, the Federal Minister of Health, the, uh, the NCDC, the various state government Ministry of Health, because not just federal now only, the state government should also be able to have their antics when it comes to um, health issues. The Ministry of Health in the various states should be up, should be empowered and should be properly funded to handle issues like this. It is not everything everything you have to do for the federal government. Federal government cannot be everywhere. So if there is a, a big, uh, uh, there is another outbreak of Lassa River in a do state, what is the do state government doing? What is the do state Ministry of Health doing about it? The federal government can only come to complement the effort of the state government. So, if the state government are not doing what they are supposed to do, then there is a big problem there. So, as I say, we always have this challenge as one is living and the rest of them. But good enough, um, they will let us also celebrate the fact that uh, we've had that there is going to be there is a, the malaria vaccine uh, has yeah. been approved. Yes. So, uh, if they start rolling that, that will be able to help, especially in Africa. Where we have close to about eighty percent or ninety percent, uh, most of the uh, sickness that uh, the devil Sahara Africa is malaria. So if we can be able to get that away and it works, then it's also going to help in this wise. So, but I think that the um, state government and various agencies of government, in the state and federal, should move in quickly, make sure to they need this support. Uh, we have at the point we know we became holo free, but some time ago we heard again that. There have been one or two places where we have an issue of polio again. So this thing will always come up, but we also must have the necessary measure in place so that anytime we see them, and, and we continue also to ask Nigerians to be very, very proactive when it comes to the issue of hygiene, because some of these things is caused by environmental hazards, um, issues of um, not keeping the environment clean and the rest of them. This in itself. So uh, the days of wule wule, if you understand what I mean, <laughs> by that, and uh, the sanitary officers uh, or sanitation officers that we used to have in those days, you know, should also be moving around to make sure that most of these places, that most of these environments are clean enough so as to prevent some of these uh, problems as it is. All right, from Edo State now, let's move to the Southeast. And I've, I've, I remember that we've spoken about this repeatedly um, because you're from the Southeast, so of course it must be personal to you. And that is the sit at home order um, in the Southeast. Um, it says on the punch still, Sit at home, gunshots rock Anambra, a guard killed in Enugu, Imo grounded. Um, of course, that's once again on a Monday yesterday. Um, there's also a news report that I spoke about yesterday where um, uh, one of the IPOB spokespersons, um, uh, Chima Obi, uh, Ch uh, I can't remember his name, Chima something, um, uh, had said that uh, there was going to be a ban in the next six months of Fulani cattle in the southeast. And of course, only... Uh, Ibukato will be sold. Uh, so, so quickly share your thoughts on where we still are with regards to the IPOB 
and its agitation and how it's affecting the people of the Southeast. I'm looking forward to pray that we a day that I'll be on this seat, that you will not ask me about this seat too. Sit that too. <laughs> because <laughs> it's either you're bringing at the beginning or you're bringing at the end. At my position, position I've always remained the same. But what is meant to me is that there was a statement by Abia State Governor yesterday. Okay, see, as I'm probably using it that um, a vanguard gave it more prominence, uh, I think, uh, this morning or yesterday. The governor had an interview and he spoke, spoke extensively on the issues at stake. And what I took out of that is in this belief that there's need for there to be a dialogue between the government and uh, IPO. He said that what is going on is now is beyond the control of the governors of the Southeast. And he also believed that those that the so-called IPO are not as dangerous as what those whatever is happening in the Northeast and Northwest. Those are the words of the governor of Abia State, Dr. Okese Ibazo. Um, but as it were, um, don't forget that the, south, the southern, the southeast governors and leaders of thought met a um, few days ago, and um, they came out with the resolution that enough is enough, and they're going to do something about it, and um, that the seats at home order will be put uh, to an end. How they're going to do that is what I don't know. But they're doing that also, as I said in my um, former intervention, that they said they're going to make sure that Ibubagu the Southeast uh, Security uh, Agency, that the one um, that's a, just like a multiple will come into place by the end of the year. How that is going to solve it. But what I feel that I've always said that there's a disconnect between the government and the people of the Southeast. Lack of confidence is the problem. If the people can be well rest assured that they will come out and their lives and property will be safe. Then, all well and good, they will come out. But if they see that that will not happen, then it becomes an issue. So, nobody wants to come out and get killed or get his property destroyed um, just because a government says you should come out and don't mind uh, what I hope or whatever says. And, and don't also forget the fact that Senator Eyinia Abaribe came out last week to say that it's not only I hope now that we have about 31 station groups in the southeast, which also means that IPOS probably have lost total control of um, uh, some of these things. So it is might not to be if some of, most of this is happening, it's, it's not by IPOP. If you come to think of it, if uh, I can go by what is in the by the there are some some other people, fifth companies and the rest of them who are taking advantage of the situation to create problem in the southeast and are the one causing most of this problem. So but the problem is that at the end of it all, you still hit the blame on IPOP. So I think there's a need for us to have a holistic look at the security challenges in the Southeast and need this in the world. Just a few days ago, um, about two soldiers were killed at the zombie uh, in, uh, in um, Imo State. And um, by certain a a individuals, there was also a killing of another set of, I think, policemen or soldiers. And then the Navy came in and able to repair that attack. So the Southeast is totally um, under siege. The economic situation of South has totally collapsed. And this is where I think the government and governors of the South have to come out and be able to need this in the board as quickly as possible. Yeah, but but, but when you say nip it in the board, what, what, what can they possibly do? And also, you know, what would you expect from the IPOB, you know, now, seeing that, you know, this may, may have even gone beyond their control? Because I've really, I've said it before that, um, these continued, you know, sit at home, they know that it has zero effect on their cause, zero effect also on releasing, you know, Namdi Kanu. Um, but they're just really enjoying the euphoria of power and you're enjoying the, you know, the feeling, you know, that, that it gives them, that they can really shut down, you know, most parts of the Southeast on Monday. Um, they're enjoying it. I also agree that there's many, you know, armed groups and, or, you know, persons in the Southeast that have taken advantage you know, of, um, you know, of what's going on and the weak security infrastructure to just wreak havoc every Monday or whenever they choose. And, of course, we will simply blame it on the IPOB. Um, so, so what would you recommend is important at this time uh, to ensure that the South East gets some sense of normalcy again, either from the IPOB or from the state governments? The IPOB have come out to say that it never... Ask people to stay at home any longer. Well, that, that obviously, that obviously is, you know, is a, yeah, is a very weak I'm statement. Just telling you, I'm just telling you that yeah. IPOB came out to issue that statement. I'm sure you also read that statement by yes. IPOB. 
What it means is that certain people are not taking advantage of the situation. And that is where I think the government, I mentioned the government, the governors, and probably the IPOB should come together. You understand what I mean? The yeah, IPOB but, but does, is, is, does it in any way seem to you that the statement the IPOB put out was really just, you know, for, you know, its sake? Um, they still are enforcing the sit at home, um, but every now and then when they are questioned, they would, you know, refer to that statement and say, oh, you know, but we've said that everybody should come out. Um, is there still a possibility that that's what's playing yeah. out? No, let me tell you, is there any evidence to show that those people are members of IPU? That is a narrative. Most of you, at times, anybody can... How many do you see people putting up police uniform? Yeah. How many do you see people putting up army uniform and wrecking havoc? So, if IPOB... I want to believe IPOB is... What they said, if IPOB is going to do something, they tell you they are doing it. There's nothing you can do to them. So, what I'm saying, in essence, is that since IPOB has set up an ECN... In, uh, it's a uh, yes, security sir. network. I, yes, yes, sir. Then the, the government of the South East and I hope we should be able to come together and make sure that they be able to arrest most of these so-called miscreants that are causing this havoc. So the so the the the, the onus is on I will be now and the government of the South East. I hope we should be able to make sure and tell us by his action that we are not behind this. And how would they do that? By making sure that they be able to handle and secure the South East as it were. And those that are taking advantage of the situation and make sure they arrest them and bring them to justice. That is the only way we can go about it. But if I probably am not able to do that, then the, the, the bad name, people will continue to equate them with what is happening in the South East. So it is, if I probably say that we are not part of this, we are not one, then let them come out, please to make sure that those behind this, I'm sure they can be able to handle that. They be able to make sure that they arrest most of those people that are behind this and make sure that they are prosecuted. The other hand, to security agencies and rest of that is where I think there should be a synergy between IPOB, the security agencies, and other the state government of the southeast. The, the, the continued delay in you know doing some of these things that you've mentioned. Um, do you agree that it continues to um, you know exposes more of the weakness of the political leadership in the southeast? Um, for a governor to come out and say, oh, you know, this is now beyond our control, and he's still governor, um, pretty much the same thing with, the, you know, the rest of them. Does this also show, you know, that they are as weak as the IPOB had declared them in the, in the past? They are even weaker. If you say they are weak, they are weaker. They are weaker than they were declared. The Southwest governors, you saw the, the, what was happening in Southwest. We are Fulani, Hesme, and the rest of them, we are... Um, practically taking over the whole of Southwest from Mundo, killing people, they moved to um, Ibadan and the rest of them, Ibarak and the rest of them, people have been killed already doing this. But the Southwest governors came out and said, enough is enough. We are going to do something about it. That has been reduced drastically. The governors of the Southwest are not doing anything. They continue sitting in their various um, state capitals and talking all sorts of things. They are going to do something that we are handicapped. But the, the Southwest, did they wait for the police? Did they wait for the army? Did they wait for the navy? They took the laws. If you drive from Lagos to um, Ibadan, going to Bumbo Shore, you will see a Montego at every point on the highway. Try to assist um, the security agencies. Can you see that in the southeast? No. The southeast um, governors have totally failed the, uh, the southerners. And that is why the people are staying at home because they know they cannot trust this government. They cannot trust those that are starting with the responsibility of keeping them safe. If they, are, if, if they believe in them, they'll be coming out on Mondays. But when they know that, if many they come out, their shops and the rest of them will be destroyed, what would you rather do? I, I, my uncle called me from the village yesterday. He said, he said my, my son, I, we don't go out on every Monday because we pray for our life. That is how bad it is. So we are talking of, and the governors are weak. They are not weak. They are totally out. They, they cannot, no governor in the South East can give an instruction. And I could be keep construction. The first they will listen to is people the South Seas. They will listen to I could rather than any governor. Is that not is not on the shame? It's a total shame. It's really sad. And that, of course this includes Ohanez and Debo and you know every other form of leadership in the Southeast. Uh, pretty much the same thing. It is or, the same thing. Uh, but, uh, has become a political tool. Uh, uh, in the hands of um, this governor. The governors now dictate uh, for Ohanez what to do. That's why you see whenever there's a meeting, Ohanez will meet. And rest of them. Or Hannes and Dibu, the leadership have played into the hands of the governors and they cannot do anything without it because most of the support they even get is from the governors. So, who plays the piper, plays the tune. So, 
from an to me to a large extent, I've become a toothless good dog. I'm sorry to say, but that is a fact. Well, hopefully we get to speak with uh, the former president, uh, General uh, Nian Wudu, um, uh, sometime this week or, or later. Uh, le le let's talk now about um, something that, of course, uh, made discussions yesterday, and that is um, one thing on the Daily Trust this morning says, 2023 attempts to cause rift between Tinubu and Oshimbajo will fail. And that's from the presidency. Who are, the, who, are, who are the people causing, causing the rift? Well, it's because mostly, you know, those who have said that, you know, the vice president, you know, would like to run for president. And at the same time, Bolame Tinubu, you know, of course, you must have seen the, you know, little bits of campaigns here and there for his own uh, shot um, at the presidency. I'm just, I'm just trying to be sarcastic. Um, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just trying to be sarcastic. And I say, who are the people causing the problem? Whatever problem, whatever is really coming from the camp of good men. It's not by any Nigeria. It's coming from the camp of Tinubu. It's coming from the camp of... Uh, uh, these are politicians, don't forget. And uh, they, will just, they, they will just take us for a right. Do you see me writing anything here and um, talking about it? Uh, the fact remains that it's all about 2023. The, president, uh, the vice, uh, vice president came out yesterday to say that President Buhari is the most, uh, I don't know how, how you use the, the statement, uh, what he write, what he used, but he come out to say he's the best uh, president Nigeria ever had. And um, that is that not disturbing to say that? Then he has also come out several times to also address. But don't forget, both of them have the right to contest. Yes. Both of them, Oshibajo is eminently qualified to contest for the presidency. Ashwajit Bola Tinubu is also eminently qualified to contest for the presidency. Some of us have seen some of the things that um, Oshibajo did when he acted as president. That shows he has the capacity. We have also seen some of the things that Ashwaji Bolaji has, uh, 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 has done as a, former, as a former governor of Lagos State and also has been able to rally support within the Southwest, especially towards um, enrolling, uh, helping President uh, Muhammad Buhari to become Nigeria's president in 2015 after four attempts. So you can't have said somebody of that nature doesn't have the capacity. So for me, it's the level, they should, they should just create the level playing ground. It is the APC that we decide is going to be. Uh, who is going to fly their uh, flag in 20, uh, 2023. And don't forget, APC have not come out here to say that the president has been uh, has been uh, set aside for a particular part of the country. There's still a debate, both in the PDP and the APC. But most likely they're going to come to this, for the APC. Most likely it's going to come to the South. Even that of the PDP is still there. So, all sorts of conceptual is coming up here and there and there. But at the end of it, you might even be surprised that it might not even be Koshima, it might not even be Tunisia. at the end of the day. Somebody from uh, from nowhere could just spin go and pick the ticket. So it is all about politicking, and um, everybody. Tinubu has come out. Don't forget um, Swagger. Um, if you have the Swagger, don't forget that Swagger was <laughs> launched uh, a few days ago uh, to prepare to start the, uh, to activate the presidential ambition of Ashwa Dipola Tinubu. And I've been seeing him uh, making comments here and there. But the question we have to ask ourselves as well is. Is Tunubu a native qualified? Yes. Is Oshiba a native qualified? Yes. Yes, Tunubu can be a godfather to uh, Oshiba. There are some instances where you have people that want to remain as godfathers forever who determines who become. Everybody must not be president. You can still be a godfather and determine who becomes the president and the rest of the shoes. If at the end of it all, uh, Tunubu decides to go for uh, the presidency and Oshiba just say, okay, my leader, I leave it for you. All well and good. If um, 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 Tinubu has then decided that, oh, uh, my boy, quote and unquote, Oshibajo, you have done enough as a vice president. Why don't you take the exhausted seat? All well and good. But the, what I'm saying in essence is that at the end of it all, it's ABC that will determine their candidate. Then it will be Nigerians that will elect presidents. So, irrespective of whatever anybody says, whoever candidate will become, it is still Nigerians, you and I, that will decide who will be the president of Nigeria. Well, it's very important, you know, to know what options exist, you know, before Nigerians go ahead to make that decision, because that's, you know, yeah, of where yes, one of the of challenges course, is. Of course. of course, yes. The alternative will be, that will say, you might just be surprised that someone, are you sure that um, um, uh, uh, Governor Payami is not interested in becoming president in 2023? Are you sure that uh, Akro Duni might not be interested in becoming president in 2023? You understand what I'm trying to say? Anything can happen, even with the PDP. Are you sure that Tambo is not interested? 
Are you sure that uh, yes, Owike is not interested? Are you sure P P2B is not interested? Even Natiku that has been talked about, are you sure he's not interested? So, it's just trade, uh, 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 horse trading here and there. It's politics. At the end of it, to all, everything we come to play, the primaries is still uh, next year. I'm sure that I think around September, October next year, that is when you're going to have the primaries of both APC and PDP to come up with their presidential candidate. And which is why now, what the political parties are trying to do is to realign themselves. Uh, that is with the PDP, what is going on, who is going to become the national chairman, where the, that is going to come from. The same thing will happen with APC, who is going to become the, the national chairman. Whether that will determine where the presidential candidate will come from or not, that is left to be seen. But this will continue to uh, continue. But what I thought, I, I think, is that we don't need all this discussion now. We still have about two years for this government to tidy up and deliver on the promises. We should not lose eyes, uh, eye, uh, we should not take our eyes off the board. Let this government deliver all the promises it promised Nigeria since 2015. Most of them have not been achieved. And it would be a shame that by 2023, they have not been able to deliver on most of the things they promised Nigeria. That in itself is going to be the key point with which we are going to examine who will become the president of Nigeria come 2023. All right. So I'm going to, I want us to go back to some of the things that I made I, I mentioned earlier, you know, and I brought up um, and I said I was going to come back to. It's from one of the reactions to former Governor Peter Obi's uh, interview yesterday, where he, of course, made statements concerning the source of his wealth, um, and of course, you know how he had been very wealthy even before politics, and politics even made him poorer. Um, of course, he got a lot of reactions across the country, but there were some that I found really interesting that I spoke about. Uh, the person here that says it's annoying that he had to go and clear his name. Some people have. Well, uh, people with questionable histories uh, who drove bullion vans into their houses but have become the next Bezaya. It says also, when you're from certain sections of the country, your kaftan has to be white and stainless before anyone considers you being worthy of presidency. From other parts, you could be a repented Chekau and you're good to go. Um, and that's what I was speaking about earlier that I want you to respond to. Um, do you think that we have equal standards set for people seeking political office in Nigeria? We don't have any, we don't have equal standards, not only in politics, but in us. And that is why um, government is going after um, IPO, going after Ibu, and um, most of the people that are causing the havoc in the northeast and northwest are being left to, to just go on rampage, killing people. Um, uh, kidnapping children and the rest of them. And even somebody that comes out on a daily basis that go into the position with them, uh, a minister, Mr. Lai Mohammed came up with this video that, uh, that uh, those, agi those agitating are the same, uh, are the same playing with um, uh, terrorists who are killing people. So there's no equal standard in all aspects of our political, social, and economic life. And um, there has also been, it's as very present as the accused of uh, lopsidedness in, uh, in appointments of um, key uh, government officials in his, uh, in his cabinet. So um, that's what you are asking about P2P. I said it before, and I said it that I don't care whoever names it comes up. The fact remains that um, P2P has come out and shows the kind of leader he is to come out to clear his names. So many other people that were mentioned have never come out to clear their names. So that shows you the integrity of the person and uh, issue. But, uh, and it's a fact, uh, as you mentioned, that there are some people that we know they are more corrupt, that have issues that need to be looked at. And that is why, uh, and, um, and that was why I said that um, that publication um, is a bit lopsided, uh, lopsided because. There are so many people that are, I know that should be on that list. I don't, not on that list. I don't know the reason why uh, Premier Times and Pandora try to shape that as well and just focus on particular people. And um, so it is their right uh, to their publication. But we know there have been instances where their names are mentioned. Info, they don't forget that were even instances where top security uh, heads were mentioned in certain... Um, uh, in certain lights, some of them that had serious several houses in Dubai. But what did we do when they retired? We also uh, went ahead to appoint them as uh, ambassadors to other countries and the rest of them. So, but um, it's neither here nor there for me. P2B is what uh, we are focusing on, and that is what I, I think. And I think he has done the right thing. Another person that is named 
should come out and defend themselves. And if you don't defend yourself, all well and good to be there. Um, maybe that this is the first part. And, and does this also tell, you know, with regards to the level of education in Nigeria? And, you know, and that basically has determined, um, uh, you know, the standards with which we set for people seeking political office um, in the country. Um, is it a level of education challenge or is it really just bias based on political affiliations and religious and tribal affiliations? Maybe that would be a thought. Yes. Um, it also... Um, I don't know. Can you repeat the question? Sorry. I'm asking, you know, does this tell really about the level of education across Nigeria's electorate um, that makes them, you know, basically see certain things and ignore, even if they are red flags already? Or is it really just telling um, about the biases that exist with regards to religion and tribe and political affiliations across Nigeria's electorate? It's both. It's both. Um, <laughs> Um, to say it's become it's good. Um, our issue has always been political, it's that uh, religious, and you know, you know, that as always the any type of those two to uh by Nigerians when it becomes a political, it, it, it becomes political, uh, necessary, politically necessary for them. They use religion, they use politics. Oh, you are from this part of the country, you are not part of the country. When you arrest somebody for corruption, you say, Oh, it's because I'm from this part of the country, I'm rest of when it comes to politics, they say, oh, these people, are, this is our own. So, until we be able to do the need, until we be able to remove politics and ethnicity from our politics, we we'll continue to find ourseles where we are. And it's at, least, at least I'm using that. Let me, let me give you a practical example. An average Igbo man has no problem with the average uh, uh, Yoruba man or Hausa man. Go to a Kibwe, if you go to a Kibwe, you will see the Yoruba man, you will see the Hausa man and Igbo man trading, buying things from each other, living in harmony. Go to Oshobo, the same thing. Go to the main heart of Kano. You will see an Igbo, an Igbo man flourishing, the, an average Igbo man flourishing. Go to Sabongari, you will see them there. Go to other parts of the... You will see... If you meet Nigerians, not Nigerians outside the country, you meet yourself anywhere, you see them bonding. They don't have issues. It is only our politicians and political elites that always bring up this um, uh, number of um, ethnicism and um, religion to divide them because they know that those are the things that they can use. Those are the things that bind them. But socially, you see that an average Nigerian or Hausa man or Igbo man or Hausa um, or Yoruba man or Efik man or whatever you call it, we always live in harmony. So even some of this security we are having, Full of the men and the rest of them. And rest of them. You'll be shocked where most of this thing is coming from. That guy, that young man you see going around with that cartoon, um, he's not the one that owns those cartoons. He's owned by certain people, certain rich men. They are the ones that arm them with AK-47 and the rest of them to uh, do those that work. So, to me, um, I think it's a, a vision of um, the making of the political elites to make sure that we are not united as Nigeria, especially those within the lower Kedah. Because once the lower Kedda are united in force, they can be able to move mountains. And they can do anything politically. So what they do is to bring in politics, bring in ethnicity, bring in religion. And what they can use that to divide us, then that is the end of it. All right. Mr. Chris Wanda, thank you very much. I know that we extended the time a little bit this morning. But thank you so much uh, for your thoughts and for your time. It's on the breakfast, it's always a pleasure. as always. It's always a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you very much. Do have a nice day. You too.